back at it again with the Mobius Dickus chapter 32 Cetology. This is an infamous chapter, I would say, in the historiography of Moby Dick reading. This is the chapter that breaks people, right? You made it 31 chapters, and then you start seeing Melville try to categorize all the whales he knows, and you're like, time out, thanks for playing, I don't want to do this anymore, I have had enough. Uh, that being said, I actually think this chapter is actually quite interesting. I actually enjoy reading it. And here's my, my overview, okay? To me, chapter 30 true is a performative enactment of a logical scientific approach to understanding or coming to truth claims about very difficult and unknowable entities or phenomena. And that obviously gets captured in the image of the whale here. I think the disappointment that one feels in response to this chapter is intentional. And I think that this chapter highlights for Melville the inefficacy and impotence of a mere physical observation of the world. I think you have to view the chapter as a sarcastic performance, or yes, it is a waste of time, not only because it was mildly inaccurate at the time, and certainly now we have much better ways of creating taxonomies for whales, but that's not really the point. So I need to prove that approach. I'm not just going to assert that and have you take it as true. So let's dive into these uh, deep waters here. The first passage I'm going to present will establish that in the chapter, as well as in other places, the whale is being used as a symbol of the unknowable. So let's take a look at these first quotations that are presented uh, by Melville. It is not my intention, were it my power, to enter into the inquiry as to the true method of dividing the cetacea into groups and families. Utter confusion exists among the historians of this animal, sperm whale, says Surgeon Beale, 1839. Other quotes are, unfitness to pursue our research in the unfathomable waters. Note how unfathomable means incapable of being fully explored or understood. And then there's also the same type of restriction of knowledge used with the rhetoric impenetrable veil covering our knowledge of the cetacea a field strewn with thorns and all these complete incomplete indications but serve to torture us naturalists so for me melville is setting up this project of trying to understand the whale and classify it physically as a problematic endeavor from the start now he's gonna go about doing that but i want you to remember this passage when we get to the end of the chapter because it's going to come full circle okay so the next passage i want to look at is just this interesting ending to two paragraphs down where uh, people, uh melville and ishmael are talking about the notion that the greenland or right whale is the highest of the whales when clearly the sperm whale is the greatest whale and he says this is charing cross which is a place in london where people would be executed hear ye good people all the greenland whale is deposed the great sperm whale now reigneth i just think it's a funny way of uh expressing his belief that the sperm whale is the biggest whale of them all who has the throne of the seas Back to the ideas. At the end of this paragraph, we get more confirmation of the role of sperm whale as the unknowable. Uh, when it says, as yet, however, the sperm whale, scientific or poetic, lives not complete in any literature. Far above all other hunted whales, his is an unwritten life. Obviously, we've got the same ideas going on here. And then we even have a kind of self-aware kind of trepidation at trying to understand or classify the poetic uh, in this passage where it says to grope down into the bottom of the sea after them, to have one's hands among the unspeakable foundations, ribs and very pelvis of the world, this is a fearful thing. What am I that I should essay to hook the nose of this leviathan? The awful tauntings of Job might well appall me. Will he, the Leviathan, make a covenant with thee? Beyond the hope of him is vain. But I have swam through libraries and sailed through oceans. I have had to do with whales with these visible hands. I am in earnest and I will try. So, yes, that is like a pretty positive and optimistic passage. But at the same time, Ishmael seems to be setting himself up for failure. He's saying like, yeah, I'm going to give this a shot, but I'm not sure this is a very good idea. I'm not sure you can understand everything about the world using solely scientific and logically positivist reasoning. 
Okay, so that self-awareness is there from the start. Okay, so we continue in a little bit and then we get the division into folios and, and uh, octavo and duodecimo. And I'm going to point out a couple of these passages which are still, even at the moment where he's beginning this classification system, kind of winking at the silliness of this project. It says, in those times also spermaceti was exceedingly sparse, spermaceti being the, uh, the oily substance that was found in the head of the sperm whale, which made it so valuable. Spermaceti was exceedingly scarce, not being used for light, but only as an ointment and medicament. It was only to be had from the dugus, as you nowadays buy an ounce of rhubarb. When, as I opine, in the course of time, the true nature of spermaceti became known, its original name was still retained by the dealers, no doubt to enhance its value by a notion so strangely significant of its scarcity, and so the appellation must have last have come to be bestowed upon the whale from which this spermaceti was really derived. So I find this a really interesting passage in the context of knowledge and truth because how it seems to point out how often our ways of labeling and understanding things contain echoes and a remnant of the past when we believed an entirely different thing, right? Like people used to believe that this spermaceti had some connection to sperm, but then of course it just turns out that this is just oil, right? It has nothing to do with sperm, but nevertheless its name refers back to a time when that belief was true and it kind of... I think this passage kind of highlights the fragility of truth claims in the abstract. Okay, one last wink and nod from Ishmael about how silly this division system is when he gets to the next page and he says, it is by endless subdivisions based upon most inconclusive differences that some departments of natural history became, become so repellingly intricate. So essentially what that means is he's saying, by endlessly trying to subdivide and label things logically, that is how certain, you know, attempts at understanding the world become so repellingly, off-puttingly intricate. They seem to lose people. Of course, he is going to figuratively enact that exact same off-putting intricacy in this chapter. So once again, there's a level of self-awareness to this chapter that I think is often underappreciated. So just so we're clear, uh, from now on through the rest of the chapter, I'm mostly going to focus on just passages that I find funny. I do think that there is a bit of dryness for the classification section. I don't think it's as dry as people say. I think there's a lot of fun little passages in here, and we're going to look at those passages. Uh, but by the time we get to the end of the chapter, I'm going to bring it back to these ideas and try to demonstrate that this whole project is self-aware and self-critical. Before I do that, I want to focus on the three primary books that Ishmael divides the whales into, the folio, the octavo, and the duodecimo. Okay, so in order to do that, we're going to take a look at these, uh, these Wikipedia articles which show you, just so you get a little bit better sense of the cetology chapter, what the heck Ishmael is talking about. So first, let's talk about the folio whales. If you are curious, there is actually a unique Wikipedia page for the cetology of Moby Dick, if you could actually believe it. Let me get the right uh, window here. Boom. If you look at my window here, you'll see that in this Wikipedia page, there's literally a listing of all the different whales and what type of whale they are. I opened up all the tabs so you don't have to. But real quick, the sperm whale looks like this. He's got the distinct head here, which is often visible in any you know artistic depiction of the sperm whale. And then the Greenland or right whale is a little bit less, uh, or, or I guess a little more curved down at the front, as you can see here in this uh, demonstration. Let's see if I can get another picture. Yeah, and it's got baleen. Baleen are these filters that are used to catch plankton, whereas the sperm whale actually has jaws uh, and no baleen. In my understanding yes you can see in the skeleton of the sperm whale it's got jaws and then of course if we go back to here we have the fin back whale okay the fin whale is very smooth and that's the way you can distinguish it it's it's kind of like the dolphin of, of the folio whales very smooth and it's called the fin whale because of this fin which Ishmael goes into then if we go back here we have the humpback whale which most of us know about living in California right we've got the classic uh, kind of markings on the front along with the hump in the back which is distinct from the 
hump in the front of the right whale, right, the hump back. And then we have razorback whale, which uh, is now a synonym for the fin back. So that's this one, our boy with the fin, finny boy, which looks like a dolphin when it's, you know, only out of the water a little bit, but it's much larger than a dolphin, as you can see. Okay. And then finally, uh, very interestingly, he refers to the sulfur bottom whale as the blue whale because they're so big that they would dive so deep that in the middle of the 19th century, very little was known about these uh, blue whales. But now we know that Melville is incorrect, that the sperm whale is not the leviathan, it is not the king of the seas, the blue whale is truly the largest. Look at that thing. How can you not like whales? Whew. That's a big boy if I ever seen it. Look at that. Look at that. How can you not find that fascinating? 19 foot skull. Okay, so that's the folio whales. Now let me move to the uh, octavo whales. Okay, so boom, bang, bong. Let's see, boom. Nope, nope. Here we go. Here we go. Okay, so in this cetology section, we have uh, the Grampus, which is what Melville calls the killer whale or the orca. I think we all know what they look like. We've got the blackfish or the pilot whale, which doesn't have the markings of the orca and has this sinister kind of lips that smile up and very smooth on top, very sleek. Okay, we've got the narwhal, which we all know about with our unicorn horn. And then we've got the killer whale, which is of course like theoretically synom synonymous with the orca. And then we've got the thrasher whale, which is also probably an orca. So many of the octavos are actually just orcas. And then of course we have the duodecimo whales, which let me pull those up if you're curious. Mm -hmm. Here we are. We have the bottlenose dolphin, which is the huzza porpoise, or huzza porpoise, as we learn from the etymology of that labeling. The uh, Algerian porpoise, uh, which I guess is a little different here. It's got the same kind of coloration as the, uh, as the, I believe it was, the, what was the previous one? The pilot whale, the same kind of black smoothness and then the, the kind of sinister smile. It's also called the false killer whale. And then we have the southern right whale dolphin, which if you remember that way back from the folios, looks very much like the fin whale with its smoothness and its white underbelly, but is about the size of a dolphin. Wowzers, isn't that more than you ever thought you would want to know about whales? But at least that gives you some con context for what Melville is talking about. Now, I want to go through some blue passages that I find fun. Like, and the only thing I'm going to say about all these blue passages is how can you not like this writing? To me, I had a little bit of a crusade here in terms of trying to prove that this chapter is not boring. It's actually quite fun to read based on just how wild its language is. So let's take a look at some of those passages that I found fun. So this is talking about the fin back, the, guy, the folio whale with that little fin. He seems a whale hater as some men are man haters. Very shy, always going solitary, unexpectedly rising to the surface in the remotest and most sullen waters. His straight and single lofty jet rising like a tall misanthropic, which means hating mankind. Spear upon a barren plain. Gifted with such wondrous power and velocity and swimming as to defy all present pursuit from man, this leviathan seems the banished and unconquerable cane of his race, bearing for his mark that style upon his back. How can you not like a description of a whale that includes the phrase tall misanthropic spear and in unconquerable cane of his race? It's just fun. If you don't have fun with that, I don't know if you really enjoy language and literature. Like, that's just, that's just fun in my opinion. Okay. Uh, back to, uh, back to the question of knowledge and labeling. Actually, I'll come back to this passage later. Let's just have some fun. I like this description of the blackfish or hyena whale, the one with the devious smile. It says his veracity is well known. And from the circumstance that the inner angles of his lips are curved upwards, he carries an everlasting Mephistophelian grin on his face. How can you not like a reference to Mephistopheles from Faust, uh, uh, sorry, not from Faust, from uh, the German legend of Faust and the Faustian bargain. I mean, that's just fun. We also have down here, I didn't highlight it, but the comparison of his 
dorsal hooked fin to a Roman nose. A little stereotype of the classical people there. Additionally, who's this about? This is about the narwhal. It says, my opinion is that however that one-sided horn may really be used by the narwhal, however that may be, it would certainly be very convenient to him for a folder in reading pamphlets. Can't you just imagine the narwhal having like all his homework paper impaled on his nose so he doesn't lose it? He would do a lot better than some of our freshmen, that's for sure. And now we move to here talking about the killer whale, which is of course synonymous with the orca. It says, the killer is never hunted. I never heard what sort of oil he has. Exception might be taken to the name bestowed upon this whale on the ground of its indistinctness, of its uh, lack of clarity. For we are all killers on land and on sea, Bonapartes and sharks included. What a line, right? We are all killers. I mean, Napoleon killed people. So why do we get to call this whale a killer whale? Aren't humans killer humans? We have chickens and cows and pigs that we slaughter every day are we less a killer whale than the killer whale uh, it's an interesting question we have his description of the thrasher which i think I, I remember is synonymous with the orca as well he mounts the folio whales back so sometimes these whales would get on bigger whales and as he swims he works his passage by flogging him like a horse as some schoolmasters get along in the world by a similar process Still less is known of the thresher than the thrasher than the killer. Both are outlaws, even in the lawless seas. Ooh, how can you not like that? And then we have his description of the dolphin. I call him the huzzah porpoise because he always swims in hilarious shoals, which upon the broad sea keep tossing themselves to heaven like caps in a 4th of July crowd. So a shoal is an area of shallow water where it's easy to see the dolphin. And then those dolphins as you've seen dolphins do they constantly jump out of the water and he relates that jumping out of the water as tossing one's cap in a fourth of july crowd i mean come on this is good stuff and then we finish out and now now that we've appreciated some of the writing i just want to go back to that notion i started with for this chapter which is if you think that melville is being super serious about this you're misreading it this is a performative, sarcastic highlighting of just how lame trying to understand the world purely through the lens of logical positivism is. Which is why, after all that work, Melville is willing to write these two lines. From Icelandic, Dutch, and Old English authorities, there might be quoted other lists of uncertain whales, blessed with all manners of uncouth names, but I omit them as altogether obsolete and can hardly help suspecting them for mere sounds, full of leviathanism, but signifying nothing. That, my students, is obviously a reference to the Act 5, Scene 5 soliloquy in Macbeth, where Macbeth says that his life has been full of sound and fury, but signifies nothing, i.e. he's been wasting his time, and what he has done with his life has meant, signified, nothing. It's not important. So at the end of the chapter, Melville kind of gives a wink and says maybe trying to track down all the different ways we can think about and label such a poetic thing as a whale is a waste of time. And then he goes even further in the next paragraph where he says, but I now leave my cetological system standing thus unfinished as the great cathedral of Cologne was left, with the crane still standing upon the top of the uncompleted tower, for small erections may be finished by their first architects, grand ones true ones ever leave the copestone to posterity god keep me from ever completing anything this whole book is a but a draft nay but the draft of a draft oh time strength cash patience so perhaps maybe true knowledge a grand project of really understanding the world is impossible and always going to be unfinished this is almost a super metacognitive moment about the book moby dick itself not just the chapter but perhaps the entire prospect of writing about things is a silly idea because if you're really going to dive deep and try to understand everything the whale is metaphorically always going to slip out of your hands so certainly i think these two passages make it pretty clear that Melville is making fun of people who think that the best way to understand the world is to be purely scientific because it's always going to be fraught with the difficulty or the ambiguity of understanding deeper, more uh, spiritual or poetic things like we're talking about 
in these chapters, uh, that whales have an unwritten life, that no matter how well we try to categorize their types of fins or their types of backs, does that really capture the wonder and poesy of encountering something so different and unknowable as a blue whale? I don't think so, and I certainly don't think the chapter thinks so. So that's my defense of cetology. I think it is not only an interesting chapter, but a fun chapter, and I invite everyone to read it.